Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to the shop. Tonight we are doing the video of how to cut a, a sunrise dovetail. This should be a very fun one because uh, you know, if you've never noticed doing a live video, we make all sorts of mistakes. So it looks very real because uh, well, it is. <laughs> um, for any upcoming notes and uh, um, um, things, uh, there was something I was just about to say. I remember what it was. I don't, I don't know what it was now. <laughs> uh, if you are planning on being at WorkbenchCon, um, I'm looking forward to being there in March. But I don't think I really have anything else woodworking-wise on the list until then. Um, uh, except for there will be an MWTCA event in, um, usually in February in uh, Milwaukee. But yeah. Mm. So, um, Sunrise Dovetails. Um, it is a, a really cool funky way to do dovetails and it looks like something it should be kind of impossible how do you actually get this together when they both get larger towards the the corner um, and they they actually go together um, at a diagonal and they take a bit if they're done right to wiggle apart and you can see how they come together like that and they go in at 45 degrees and theoretically they slide back together there we go <laughs> uh, they are not an easy joint. Uh, so if this is your first dovetail, I don't generally suggest jumping in at this. Um, but if you get into doing dovetails and you've done a few of them, um, it's not that difficult. Uh, it's one of those things where you just have to understand where the problems are going to be and be ready to spend the time there. Uh, they will take longer than a regular dovetail, um, but they are a lot of fun and uh, they add a lot. And I'm actually doing a, a drawer here uh, where I'll be putting these onto it. And I just like the look of them. They're, they're a way to spice it up, make it a little different. And uh, the nice thing about it is they're, they're a good show tail. Because the boards have to come, across, come apart at 45 degrees, they, they hold themselves together. So you don't have one board that can slide straight off of the other one. They have to slide at uh, um, angles. And so the whole drawer has to kind of come apart. And uh, yeah, so let's jump into this. And if anyone has questions, throw them in the chat and we might get to them. Um, but this joint took me... The practice joint I did today um, was about 45 minutes. And so for the live, we may or may not make it all the way through this. So if we don't make it all the way through today, we'll finish up the rest next week. Um, but I think we can. So first thing we have to do is figure out how in the world we lay this out. And to do the layout, you can't just do it on the board. You have to start on another piece. And I actually like to grab another board with a jointed edge and use this as a way to draw out what we're actually doing on this. So I'm going to try and do a lot of the uh, up close shots here um, so you can see a little bit more about what's on the bench. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one of our boards that we're going to do this on and I'm going to put it up flush to the end here and I'm going to draw this board on the surface. And this isn't absolutely necessary. Um, I like to do it just because it makes it a little more visual using a very fine mechanical pencil. I'm going to be doing a lot of the marks with pencil today is sometimes it's hard to do with a knife. And I'm hoping you can see those. Um, probably not though. <laughs> then the next thing to do is I need to put the end on here because I need to know how thick this board is. So I'm going to try and make this one a little bit darker. So I've got a three quarter inch piece here um, and then this down here. Now what I want to do is I want to draw a point that is in the center of this board. So I could lay it out on the board itself and I want to figure out where is the, the center of this. Um, and so I'm just going to grab a measure here and it is slightly shy of three inches. So ever so slightly shy, I have an inch and a half in. The center point doesn't have to be dead perfect. It just has to be relatively close. And I'm going to come just slightly sure shy of that. Um, if the center point is off, then um, you're not going to have, um, what am I looking for here? If the center point is off, then the tails will just be ever so slightly off center of reality. Keep breaking my lead. One of the problems with having a, oh no, I'm just out of lead. Oh, stink. <laughs> I was practicing earlier and ran out of lead. Well, in that case. Here, can I throw something at you? No, I'll use a pen. Um, and I just have to remind myself where my marks will be. I should have just thrown it at you, not asked. Well, that, that's normal. You know, that's okay. Mm. And uh, these marks will probably be a little bit more visible. So, actually, let me go ahead and mark these out just a little bit more. 
and hopefully those will actually stand out to you guys on the camera because I've had a lot of people saying I wish you would use a pen or a pencil so we could actually see it because usually I'm just going to use a knife and uh, I can see that fine but uh, it doesn't always come across on camera so there's the board and I want to make a mark down centered on the board usually twice the thickness of the end of the board so if this is three quarter inch I want to make a mark down from there an inch and a half so an inch and a half plus the three quarter inch is two and a quarter inches down it doesn't have to be absolutely precise it can be just about anything I like the look of about um, twice the thickness down so somewhere in there and so I'm going to make a point on here I'm just going to put this in and we're going to go tink and so I've got a center mark there what I want to do is I want to draw rays out from that point rays coming out so the rays of the sun coming out from this point farther down so if this is three quarter inch then I would have inch and a half down below the bottom or two and a quarter inch total um, and if this gets a little confusing um, I'm sorry I do have an old video that I did it a slightly different way um, so if you want to watch that I have a link to that one down below it's like uh, two or three years ago we did another live on it because um, it's, it's just a fun joint and there's a bunch of different ways to do it um, so if one way doesn't click to you then don't worry about it next thing you're going to need is however many rays you want on it you're going to need <laughs> a bevel gauge for those rays so if you want three rays you need three bevel gauges you want four of them you need four bevel gauges and I'm going to do this with three and then I'm going to go through and I'm going to mark them all one two and three um, and I have them marked up with number one are the rays closest to the middle twos are the next one out and threes are the farthest ones out if you have four then they're even farther out um, so we need to actually figure out how do we actually set these up to different angles because they all need to be at different angles and I'm going to grab my dividers here we are and I'm going to put them out. I like my rays to be about a quarter inch apart. So I have a mark on center. That means I need to set this at an eighth inch. So I'm going to set my dividers at an eighth of an inch. And I'm going to put one of the tines into that middle. Oop, it moved on there. Why did it move? Because these aren't tight. There you go. So I'm going to go eighth inch mark, Oop, a little deeper. And then I'm going to go off the other side, eighth inch in the other direction. And now I know that these are, let me see if I can show you this a little bit closer here. These are points um, are a quarter inch wide, but they're each an eighth inch off of the middle. So I know point to point is a quarter inch. So now I'm going to take my dividers, I'm going to set them into those two points, which should be a quarter inch. You can take it over this to make sure, and sure enough it is. And then I'm going to put them on here, I'm going to walk them out. So that the first dot is my first point, I need a second point, and then I need a third point, and I'm laying them out along that baseline. And then we're going to come over this way, because I've, I'm doing three rays. So two and three out this way and so now I've got these points on the baseline and then I've got this point farther back I'm going to take my pin put it in the dot put it in the dot and I'm going to lay out these points Oop, not quite that much and most of this joint your time is going to be spent in layout there is no way to gang cut these. There is no way to speed it up. You're just going to be doing a lot of simple layout. Are there any questions right now, babe? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I'm trying to... There's some that aren't necessarily project related, so I'm going to save those towards the end. Okay. Um, so we've got our layout here. Can you do these on all four corners of a box? Yes. Yeah, um, it's just rather than the two ends coming in to the pins, um, all four sides have to crush together. Um, so yes, you can do them, and it's just it's a little bit more tedious to put them around. Um, but yeah, you can put them on all sides. Um, and you can do, rather than just having one set in the middle, you can have a whole other set beside them and a whole other set beside that. So you can have sunrises side by side if the drawer is deeper. Um, looks really cool, but uh, we only have time to do one. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my bevel gauge number one and I'm going to 
loosen it up. I'm going to bring it over here and I'm going to set it on that first line. Very, very carefully, lock it down. Back this up so you can see this a little better. And now, this bevel gauge is set up number one. Now I want to make sure that the beam sticks out farther this way so I can use either end of it. So if I flip it over, um, I should be able to match up with the other line. And look at that, it does line up. Hey, happiness. Now you only have to ma map out one half, but it, it looks good to map out the whole thing so you can kind of see how it goes. Let's set up number two then. I'm going to move the beam towards the middle so I have access to both sides of it. Put that on here. And this is one that I made not too long ago uh, from a kit. This is one of my favorite simple Stanleys. This is one uh, from a Bridge City, Cities toolkit that uh, a friend of mine made for me for a Christmas gift a couple years ago. And I've got probably about six bevel gauges and I've had a few projects where I've had all the bevel gauges in use. Okay, so now these are all set up with whatever these angles are. Whatever that angle is, I don't care as long as it matches up on this and I'm using the same one for every use. So I have one, two, and three. With that in, now we can actually start the layout on the boards. Um, setting up the bevel gauges is what this is for. You need to be able to draw a point out farther than the surface um, and so you need something else. You could do it on a piece of paper but I like doing it on a block of wood. It just makes it a little bit simpler. Next thing I need to do is going to be, just like any other dovetail, we need to mark the baseline. And my marking gauge was here. There it is. It's hiding underneath the glue. Um, so I'm going to set this up to the thickness of the board and mark in on one of these. Now, you can't really say which one of these is tails and which one is pins. So I'm going to say the one that has the shoulder on the outside, that's going to be the tails. The one that doesn't have the shoulder on the outside, that's going to be the pins. Um, so however you want to do it. So I'm going to make this one the tails board. And it's going to have the shoulder, so I'm going to mark this one all the way around. <laughs> Sorry, just had a... What's that? Funny pop in my head. What's that? Um, would this be the type of joinery that would be in... Um, oh, what's the character's name? I can't think of it now. My mind just went blank. Ducktails. That was gonna be my joke. That it, that they're ducktails. They're duck. Oh, like dovetails. The ducktails. Yeah, I got it. The um, way you just said it, but I can't think of the character. Which one? Scrooge. Ducktails. Is it Scrooge? Uh, Scrooge. Miserly duck that has the. Oh, I was thinking. Has the whole room full of money he swims was, through. What was I confusing it with then? I don't know. Oh, the bear <laughs> pilot. The other uh, other spinoff. Oh, tailspin. Tailspin. That's what I was confusing it with. So on the other board, one of them I'm going to mark all the way around, and the other one I'm just marking on the face on both sides because uh, we don't need to cut the shoulders, so there's no reason for the mark to go all the way around, unless you like that look. So we're going to start with the tailboard, and I have the mark on the outside face. We're going to put that in here, and I'm going to have the mark, the, the, the outside face, the reference face, towards me. And now we need to do the layout. And the layout on this, actually I'm going to do that here flat, it'll make it a little bit easier for you to see. Uh, the layout on this is going to be on this line, and it's basically going to be this same marking that we just made on this board, we're going to make on this baseline here. Um, and, let me just make sure I'm thinking through this correctly, that's on there, that's on there, yes, 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 yes. Um, so I need to mark out where the center of this is again, and I'm going to do it all with the pin to make it a little bit easier to see. Now, I could have just done all this layout on here to begin with. Um, inch and a half and a sixteenth, so right there. Um, no, that's not right. Oh, that's why. There's center. Um, I didn't want all the marks in this face, but if you're going to be planning it all off, then having all of these marks in there is not going to be a problem. Um, but if you like to keep the face pristine, then leave the marks for something else. Now we're going to come in with this. With that center, I'm just going to kind of eyeball where that center quarter inch is. And then we're going to walk off quarter inch marks along that line. Two and three. Come back over here. Go in that hole. 
two, and three. So there's the base of all of our sunrises. Now we're going to come in here with this, and we're going to lay out all those lines we just created. So we we'll put the pin in there, one up, flip it over. Actually, I'm just going to slide it over, use the other side. Put the pin in the mark down there. Now we're going to grab the two, and it's going to be a lot of the same. This over and over again, and then we're going to do it on the end as well. <laughs> and this is where all of the time in this joint goes. It's just this layout, because you have to do this layout over and over and over again on all sides and with all boards. Uh, let me do this one first. There's that. And then we need this one. And so this is one of three sides laid out. So I've got mark, mark, mark. And I'm going to come in here then with a Sharpie now that I have this on here. And I want to get rid of the shoulders in this one. And then I'm going to go every other. So I'm getting rid of this one. And I'm getting rid of this one. So I'll have three fans. One, two, three. Now I'm going to pick it up, put it in here. And I'm going to do the same thing on the top, but as these got wider on this corner, they're going to get narrow as they go back. So let's start back here with this one, and this one needs to go on to here. And this one needs to go on to here. That's one. Then let's grab two. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect time. So does this, this is just me asking a question related to the topic. Um, so you, you said you needed as many bevel gauges as rays. So does it work with only two or is a three minimum preferred? Um, two could work. It just doesn't look as good. Okay. So it's I usually guess. three or four. Sometimes okay. people will stretch it to five, which looks really cool, but it's a lot of work. And also with five, you tend to have very small rays, and they go at really wide angles that make them a little harder. Um, so three is normal. Okay, now I've got that marked. I'm going to then transfer X, line, line, X. Now I can continue it around and do it on this side. And as they got smaller towards the back end here, they're going to get smaller again towards this side here. So I can continue around and do those marks. But I'm not. I'm going to trust my saw because I know that if I hit this line and this line, the backside is going to take care of itself. So I'm not going to even mark the backside on this. Any questions so far? Not related to the topic at okay. hand. So, dovetail saw. Uh, this one, actually, let me get this up on here because this is kind of fun. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to cut one of these with it upright in the bench. And I find this to be exceptionally difficult. I'm going to start here in this corner. I want to go on the other side of it, though. This side really doesn't matter which side of the line I'm on, because I'm going to make the other the pins match whatever the tails are. I'm going to go back along the line. Establish on the top. And now I'm following at a weird angle. I'm just cutting the line I can see from corner to corner. Going very, very lightly. And now that it's established from corner to corner, I'm just going to cut with the kerf guide the back of it. Make sure I touch that on the back. And that works. What I like to do is actually turn the, the blank so that the lines are mostly vertical. I mean, I could come in with a level and make sure they're perfectly vertical. Um, but I find this a little bit easier because now my saw is running vertical. I'm just turning on the board, just like I'd be cutting pins. Established. Oop, almost established. Not quite established. There. Established on the top. And now we can cut down the line I can see. Oop. Getting a little off that line. Let's bring it back onto that line. I actually got to raise it up. I'm running into my vice below. You raise me up. So 
I have a question for you. Let me just finish this in the chair. Okay. So now I'm established corner to corner. Down to the stop line. What you got? So I think I'm remembering this tip correctly, and I'm not sure that it applies to these particular dovetails. So when you're cutting, you know, you can see like the mirror reflection to see if it's that not on this one. This work. is a compound okay. angle. Not only is it cutting at a, a miter, but we're also turning at an angle. So it's actually a compound, two angles. So no mirror is going to, it'll just be a weird angle going off the other direction. But on regular dovetails, you could do that. Um, or no. Regular dovetails, if you're on the pins and you turn the saw, you can see if the board is, is level and you can get an idea. If you're cutting perfectly straight across and cutting at 90 degrees, the mirror will tell you exactly where you need to be. With tails, it doesn't really help you much. Gotcha. And with this, no. Cutting corner to corner. Down to the stop. So there's three of six on one board. <laughs> Corner to corner, down to the stop cut. One more. And these last outside ones, as they get off into an extreme angle, it kind of plays with your brain. And your brain thinks they should be a different way than they are. Trust the lines, make sure you hit the lines, get good at cutting to the line, establish it right, and then let the saw do the work for you. Just like that. So now we need to cut these shoulders off. This is going to feel fairly similar, except I'm going to back it up and do it off of the end of the bench over here. And on this one, it's just like cutting off the shoulders on the regular dovetails. It's just you cut at an angle at the end. Make sure I'm on my line back here. There we go. And on this one, I could use the mirror trick, making sure the board continues through. Oop, I gotta go down on this. Before we go any farther, I'm going to grab a chisel and clean out all that space. Now, the nice thing about these is they get this huge shoulder, um, which is nice, but can be a bit of a pain because it's a lot of real estate to cover. So then we're going to flip it around, do the same thing on the other end, except I'm going to move it over to the other end of the vise so that I can... Uh, actually, here, I'm just going to rotate the board. <laughs> I was gonna say. <laughs> I'm used to just flipping from one end of the vice to the other. I find that easier than rotating the board. Um, right. But for video's sake, do you it's be nice in the to be able to do thing. this one. What's that? Nope, you changed just as I was gonna ask. Where am I line still? On the line. Good. up that tight corner. Now we need to clean out those two pieces in the middle and it's a lot like taking out regular pins um, but <laughs> at angles and everything about this is it's just like doing it regular but at a weird angle. Um, so I'm going to get a sacrificial, sac sac sacrificial piece of wood, a sacrificial piece of wood <laughs> it's like from Night at the Museum when they can't say Sacagawea. Sacagawea. <laughs> and 
I'm grabbing my 1 8 inch chisel. Um, now, you're going to hear a lot of people say, you don't need a 1 8 inch chisel. You don't need a 1 16th inch chisel. But there are a few things in the shop that can't be replaced with some other tool. An 8 inch chisel or a 16 inch chisel cannot be replaced with any other tool. When you need to get into a tight space, you need a tight space tool. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's one of those few tools that you can't replace it. You can't do it with anything other than a uh, chisel that fits into it. It was just there. So and now I it's down there. That's feeling why. that those chisels just went on several people's Christmas lists. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to start with this a little ways away from the line. And also at a weird angle because they all splay in toward the middle. And these ones, I'm just going to go ahead and pop it back here. Chop out that piece. So if you don't have a hold fast like that, is there... You just put it up against a wall or something to stop it. Just a planing stop will do fine. The hold fast, you can see here, I don't even have much pressure on it, so it's not. It's rotating slightly on me. And I'm just going to go through to here. I'm not going to go all the way through from this side. And now that I've cleaned out that, I can come back here right into that knife line. Make sure I guard that up nicely. And again, the only thing that matters is the outside face. If the inside isn't absolutely perfect, oh well. No one is ever going to see the inside. At some point, you'll even forget that the inside is bad. I don't know when that time is, but sometime around a eh, day or two before you die. <laughs> well, there you go. It's just a lot of rinse and repeat. And the weird thing about this joint is that both sides ooh, went a little too far. That's fine. I always start with the outside face, the side that you can see. So if I do go a little bit too far, it's on the inside where you're not going to see it. Okay, now we loosen this up. Flip it over. Do the same thing from the other side. Except from this one, we're going the other direction. I'm going to stay a little ways away from the line. But because I'm right there already, now we can go into the line. That's all that one needs. A little ways away from the line. And then... Right into the line. Now I'm going to come back in here and just make sure I get rid of all the junk in here. And that is all we need for the pins. How are we doing in time? 28. Okay, we're good. I think we might actually get this all done today. Um, I'm going to grab a file in here and use that to come in. Make sure I actually can see what I'm doing. Back that up a little bit. I'm going to come into the file. Smooth out those faces. And I'm not going to do a whole lot here. I'm just getting rid of any burrs or anything that's obvious. Anything that would preclude the actual joinery. Because I'd rather do the obvious stuff now. Then when I'm trying to figure out, why won't this joint go together? Any questions right now? Uh, let's see. Dennis Miko asked, are there commercial jigs or patterns sold to make this joint? <laughs> no. This is one that's hand cut. If you see this, it's hand cut. I mean, okay. Theoretically, if you had the right jig, you could maybe do something very similar to this on a table saw but you'd still have to come through and clean out the bottom if you want a flat shelf on the bottom. Yeah, I, I honestly couldn't think of a way of doing this because of these being splayed out. Did I have that off-centered? I did have that off-center. How did I do that? I don't know. My tails are off-center. Well, they're off-center this way by about eighth of an inch. Oh well. <laughs> 
<laughs> this joint is all about layout, and if you rush the layout, then you're running into it. So now we need to transfer these marks over to here. And this is the point where you've got to wrap your brain around this. You've got to spend some time and, and think about what's happening to this. Now I'm going to show you what, what, what I think about when I, when I do this. Is I want these boards to go together this way. So in theory, this outside corner is going to be touching this outside corner. This corner of the shelf is going to be touching this corner of the shelf. This corner of the tails are going to be touching this baseline we drew over here. So when it comes together, all of these points need to be exactly where these points are. <coughs> all of these points need to be exactly where these points are. So I could transfer those marks really simply by taking these, laying them down, and putting them together like this. And I'm going to grab another board, set it over here, push those up against it, like that, and then, because I like to slip and slide, I'm going to grab a couple squeeze clamps. Oh, need to get the bigger ones. I'm going to grab a couple squeeze clamps to hold this in place. And it's amazing that the peace of mind that just squeezing it down gives you, that things aren't moving around because you want this to be accurate. Except for, I'm not going to do it to that board because that board has cutouts where I'm squeezing and so it's bending it up. <laughs> uh, let's grab this one. That'll do. That'll do nicely. So with this one, we're going to slide <laughs> that one on and that one on. And if they move around a little bit um, rolling, that's not a problem as long as these are flat on the board. Let me do this. As long as these are flat on the board and they run into each other. This is just a jointed edge to make sure that those joints are the same. And I'm going to move this one over a little bit more so I have space to work. I'm going to grab my marking knife and I'm going to come in here and I'm going to transfer all six of these points. And you see I'm going to rotate it each time to put the flat of the knife on there. And I'm also matching the angle with the knife itself so I can get all six of these marks. <laughs> Did you do it wrong? I need them on this end of the board. <laughs> See, the arrows should be pointing at each other. I'm like, well, something's wrong here. Where's my stop game mark? <laughs> this is the way it should be. The joys of lives. You never know what you're going to come across. I do not know how Roy Underhill produced so many shows in a single take. And if you didn't know it, all of his shows are a single take. The whole thing is done with one thing. They get it running, they shoot the whole clip, and <laughs> that's that. And that's why he has so many cuts and nicks during it. And you'll see him like, and nevertheless. <laughs> He's not doing it while having three children at home. <laughs> So we're going to put this over in here. Actually, I'm just going to do the first one here. And we're going to grab those three bevel gauges that we had set up without knocking them out of joint. And we're going to grab number one first. And with those points, now I can grab my pen, flip this over, and I'm going to find those spots. They're over here, that's right. And then... You can transfer these lines around and do exactly what we did before. So there's one, nope. and then two. Those. Make sure, am I on the right lines? One, two, three. One, two, three, up, yeah. down. Remember, they're going to walk off center. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I was looking at, making sure. It's an eighth inch off. And then I need three. Where's three? Three's over there. You're going to call that the Steve Urkel? Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I know that was a terrible impersonation. <laughs> One, and then uh, this way. Is 
three. So we're gonna put it in here, and then we're gonna do those six marks all over again. This joint is all about the layout. It's where all the time goes, and if you're rushing the layout, you're gonna have problems. And again, as they get bigger, that's not right. Is that really that far off center? Um, double check. It is that far off center. <laughs> yeah. Go figure. I'm blind. It's okay. We all make mistakes. So we put this in that mark, slide it up against, line it across the top, flip it over, do the same thing on the other side. Try not to cover up the, the camera. Wands. And any questions? Uh, let's see. Idle Hands Workshop asks, since you're using it a lot, would you recommend the Veritas double screw vise you've got there? I'm looking for a functional upgrade on my table. That's why I'm asking. I love, 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 love this vise. Um, you know, if I had to pick one vise, I would probably do the uh, 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 um, Klein Speed vise, but uh, I would also have to have a decent amount of money for it. I mean, it's really not that expensive in comparison. It's a little more, but not by that much. But it is a seriously cool vise. Um, second to that, the Veritas Twin Screw. Um, it's just, I, I love it. Okay. it. It gives you the, the flexibility of all the vices. You can have the dogs, you can have your face vise, you can have your moxin vise. Um, it comes out far enough, I can clamp really big things in this. Uh, it's just an all around amazing vise, and I, I love it. All right, Whoop. before we go any farther, let's bring this over here, grab the Sharpie. Okay, you know you're on the wide camera, right? Yes. Okay. And if you do that, all of your joints will be perfect. <laughs> I love that. Maybe you didn't watch the short I did recently with the uh, uh, Roy Underhill joke with the, the sawing noise and the perfect joint. Um, I had so many people like, I couldn't hear you. You were sawing at the same time. <laughs> That's the joke. <laughs> so let's go back over to this. And let me get the camera in the way of my actual work. So I can make sure I do bad job here. And I want to stay on the mark side of the cut. And cut corner to corner. Oh, still in the way. Now, are you cutting the face or the back? Oh. Because I'll cut corner to corner. I have lines in this face and this face. I don't have lines in the back. I'm just going to trust the curve to go. Okay. But I'm going to wait until this gets all the way from corner to corner, and then I'll cut the back. Just make sure you stay on the right side of the line. thing about this joint is it's challenging. Um, even if you're you're really good with a saw, this joint is one you still got to wrap your brain around. You still have to spend some time on it and it's still never going to work perfectly off of the saw. You're going to have to do some fiddling with it. And so the nice thing is you're going to see me do fiddling here in a little bit. And I'm not very good with a violin, so. Oh, come on, that was funny. I wasn't listening to you. Oh, well, that's the reason. <laughs> Go to the corner. I want the corner to corner to be dead on. I want to hit that line. But in the back, 
my brain is thinking, I'm going to undercut it a little bit and take out a little bit more than I need because the back of it doesn't matter. If it's a little sloppy back there, the joint's still going to work perfectly. If you get the lines on the front right, then it's going to look good too. One more. Oop, wrong side of the line. Other side. And there, you see it was catching. That was me getting aggressive, wanting to get the cut done and putting force into the saw. Don't do that. Let the saw off. Let the saw do the work. This bottom horn here takes all the weight off of it. And that will allow you to lighten up on it. So if the saw is jamming, you're usually putting too much force into it. Okay, now we can remove the waste in between and watch them slide in absolutely perfectly on the first try. So if you didn't have a dovetail saw, what would be your next best recommendation? Hacksaw. hacksaw. Yeah, um, surprisingly a hacksaw is a really, relatively decent um, dovetail saw. Works really well. Um, I mean, the next closest thing would probably be a carcass saw. Um, those work relatively well. It's a cross-cut tooth. So that's a little different, but uh, still works. All right, let me set this up so you can actually see what's going on here. Focus, there we go. Look at that, it focuses. There we go. And I grab my mallet. And now we're going to stay away from the line again and go tappity tap tap. Any questions now? Um, Logan wanted to know what TPI is your dovetail saw. Um, mine, I think, is 16, 18. Um, I usually don't like going any smaller than 16 or 18. There just is not a benefit to that. Um, it becomes incredibly difficult to sharpen and just doesn't have the corresponding benefit. Um, so I'm not a fan of like 20 TPI or 24 TPI. Um, or I've seen some that are 30 TPI. I'm like, no, that's not uh, not something I want to mess with. <laughs> not something I ever want to sharpen. Yeah, let's do this one first. I could probably come in here with my 3 16th chisel if I had one. Is that Actually, a I think I do have a 3 16th chisel. Usually it's eighth inch, quarter inch, because if you're going smaller than a quarter inch, three sixteenths doesn't have a whole lot of use over an eighth inch. Because the thing is, you can you can do a quarter inch chisel's work with an eighth inch chisel. It's going to take you longer, but you can. But you can't do an eighth inch chisel's work with a quarter inch chisel. So having one small one in stock is a nice thing to have. Got stuck in. Maybe I tapped it a little too far. But again, I'm starting on the show face. Because if I blow out the other side, I would rather it be on the inside where people aren't going to see it than on the show face where people will see it. One more, and then I flip it over. Got another question? Uh, let's see. C. Joe wants to know, do you have recommendations for files? For files? Um, generally, no. Um, most all of my files have come from estate sales and garage sales, where you'll find a bucket of files for 15, 20 bucks. And I'll buy the bucket of them, I'll bring them home, and I'll throw away most of them or recycle them, um, or give them to my blacksmith friends. And uh, then I'll keep the three or four that I want. And I find that to be the most cost-effective way. Um, good files are expensive. Um, you can get good files, and for a lot of things, the cheap files work perfectly fine. You don't need to spend a crazy amount on those. Oop, make sure I'm doing the right one. Going in at the correct angle. 
and the middle one, right? Yeah, the middle one. So they didn't mark the backside. So it's better to double check than to go, oop. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you never want to hear a Midwestern doctor say, oop. <laughs> and I guess you don't want to hear your Italian doctor say, opa. <laughs> Okay. That'd um, be Greek anyway. What's that? That'd be Greek. Greek, yeah, sorry. Keep thinking Italian because that's the family you've got. Getting rid of all of the little wisps and burrs inside, anything that's obvious. Put this in here and show you a little bit about that. And at this point, the joint is basically done. Um, except for we have to get these together. And surprisingly, that's where a lot of this work goes. So I'm just going to hit all six faces of this. Get rid of anything that's sticking out on the inside. Make sure there's nothing on the bottom. And theoretically, if all is good, this and this should match up. I should be able to get them to slide straight in and it works perfectly. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I've never had to do that before. <laughs> you say that every line. <laughs> it's not perfect. It's not perfect. I'm going to do a little work here. Because um, it has to go at 45 degrees, you've got to kind of work it from here and here. It's a bit gappy. Oh, it's a big, big gappy. That's why it's sliding together. <laughs> All right, let me take a look at this and see where the problem is. Leaving them is there really suspense. any problems? It's just gappy. Um, so one of the, the, the things I'm often doing is I want to see is the board getting all the way down to the stop cut line on both of them. And so what I can do is hold it up to the light and see if I see light coming through the gap um, underneath the board this way or this way. And in this one, I don't see any light coming through. So this board is down all the way. But on this one, I'm seeing light coming through all the way across. So this board is not down all the way. So let's just give it a little Wait, tap tap. I was going to say, you got to show them. What's that? We can't see it. I know you can't, and I'm never able to show you on video. It's just, it's a tiny Put bit of light. Put some Windex on it. That's exactly right, Alex. Yes. <laughs> okay, and there. And so what I can do now is I can see where I could see light all the way across, and I give it that little bit of tapping. I can see light most of the way across, except for there's one point in the middle where I can't see any light coming through. And that tells me that one point is where there's junk stopping it from going all the way down. So I'm going to make sure I remember... Where that one point is, where is it? there it is, there. right there, that one there. So I'm going to put my finger on it and pull it apart, take my finger off it and forget where it's at. <laughs> okay, right here. So I'm seeing in this one, there you go. Um, let's see, in this space here, there's some junk up in here. That's stopping it from going all the way down in between these two teeth. I'm good here, I'm good here, I'm good here, I'm not good here. So we're going to get that chisel out. And I don't have a file to get in here, otherwise I'd probably just do that. And I'm going to undercut it just a little bit right there. Am I on the cut line? Yeah, I'm on that line. Make sure I'm not touching the line, just getting rid of the schmoo on the inside. Let's try it again. And usually what you're going to find is that it goes together to about here and it just doesn't go any together any farther. And you really got to work on it. What I usually end up doing is coming in with the chisel and flattening out these faces a little bit more, hollowing out the middles a little bit, kind of dishing them out a little bit on the inside. And that shows you often where it's touching, where it's rubbing. So let's see how does this one. That's a lot better. 
Now, this is a really, really gappy one. Um, here, let me do a little tweaky tweak. Which is really sad because I did my test one this morning and it looked awesome. I'm like, oh, tonight's going to be great. This is going to look great. This one's got gaps. That's what happens uh, when you're off center. The big difference is I did that one with a knife and I thought, I'm going to have the great idea. I'm going to do it all with a pencil tonight so that people can see the lines because this one you really need to see them to understand it. And anytime you do it with a pencil, you introduce thickness. Um, whereas a knife, there, there's no thickness there. The knife is the first cut. And you get an exact line every time. Whereas with a pencil, you have a, a there's a certain amount of thickness to it. And then I bumped it up to a pin, which is like twice the thickness. Um, and you double the thickness because you have to draw the line on one board and draw the line again on the other board. Uh, so yeah. But here, let's take a closer look at this. Oop, maybe not that close. Let's go out to like there. And so here you can see, yeah, this one's pretty pretty gappy. Um, and when I actually go to glue it up, I clamp it up, and I'd be able to get rid of that gap. But you can see up in here, oop, here, there's a good bit of a gap. Here, there's a good bit of a gap. Uh, this one, oh, why that one? That one's got a lot of gap. <laughs> so it's not terribly pretty, but it would be completely functional. I would, I would definitely use this on a drawer. Um, you could do the sawbush trick. Um, usually, the, uh, the, my favorite, if I have to do it, is to take um, a, one of the cutoffs from all of that and create a tiny little wedge out of it with a chisel. Here, let me show you that for a moment. And so I can take this, which is out of focus. There we go. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to set this up. I'm going to give it a little tap tap. And I've created these tiny little wedges. And with these, I can then jam them in in here. And with the glue up, I'll come through after I've glued it up and I'll jam in all these wedges along there. And what that does is it actually creates the end grain to fill up. And it's hard to fill up with oak because you see so much of this grain structure from the dilly arrays. But for something like maple, um, you can make these disappear by jamming wedges into that, uh, into that crack. Uh, it looks so much better than sawdust. Um, sawdust always makes it look like a gap you're trying to hide. Uh, whereas these uh, sometimes just looks like maybe there's a problem with the wood. Um, Can you that's usually my way to fix show it. Show your first one per their request. Oh yeah, um, here. Oop, that one. So here's my one from earlier. Here. Whoa. Yeah, let's do that again. There we go. <laughs> so there is the joint from this morning, and yeah, that one looks a lot better. Went past the the saw marks a little bit here. Then this one, I have a little bit of a gap up in here, but uh, not much. That one's actually pretty nice and clean. And I like to leave my, my groove bottoms open like this, and then I'm going to do that same thing here. I'm going to grab these blocks of wood and just jam them in there, and that tends to hide them nicely. Um, but yeah, there's the sunrise dovetail. So that's the, the, front, whoop, the front of the drawer. Uh, so this will be an upcoming project. <laughs> Oops, if I don't hit the black, <laughs> this will be an upcoming project we're making. Uh, my, my daughter and I are making a uh, coffee organizer to take ah, up less space. Oh, that's what you're doing. So, yeah. It'll hide a lot of the accoutrement. Yes. So we got uh, a couple minutes left. What do we got? Um, Hosman wants to know, if you soak the ends in water, do they swell enough to cover gaps? Um, Initially, when they're wet, yes, but then they'll dry out and, <laughs> and then you got problems. Um, and what happens is when they're wet, they'll swell up and they'll actually, all the fibers inside will compress because they're all pushing against each other, each other. And then when they dry out, the gaps will be even bigger. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> uh, it's the same reason why you don't ever um, get the head of an axe wet uh, because the fibers inside will all swell up with water and they'll all crush themselves. And then when it dries out, it'll shrink and the head goes flying off next time you swing it. Uh, so, was it uh, Thoreau? Thoreau? No, it was uh, one of the poets did a thing about that. About what? Walt Whitman, the rare. He, he did um, at the pond. Um, uh oh. Um, it was in one of his books. He had an anecdote yep, about that. Yep, 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 yep. 
So what we got? Uh, let's see. Woodworking with Logan wants to know, are, what are your tips for cutting normal dovetails? <laughs> um, ha have fun. Um, the, the, one of the cool things about dovetails is even if they look bad, like this one, this one, I mean, you know, a lot of people are going to say that that's okay. Um, and really, you put some glue on that and it'll, it'll disappear. There really isn't any problem with that one. Um, but even if they're really gappy, they're still functional. And it's one of the great things about dovetails. So don't worry about it. Um, yeah, they're not going to look perfect right off the bat. But the only way you're going to get better at it is to do them more. There, there is no, you do this and they will be better. The only thing you can do is more of them. Um, yeah, you can, you, can, you can watch more videos and you can buy better tools and you can spend more time thinking about it. But none of that's really going to make them any better than, than just going out and doing it. So um, usually the, the biggest skill is learning to get them to fit off of the saw. The less chiseling you do, usually the better the fit is going to be. Most of the time, the, the thing that causes gaps is trying to chisel it back to the line. You end up going over it. Um, so if you can get it to fit off of the saw, that is what you really want. What's next? It's Walden Pond. Walden Pond, yes. All right, so I'm going into a couple of questions that are not necessarily related to this project. There's just a couple of them. Cool. Jose Morrell asked, when working with tongue oil on a project made of birch, plywood, and hickory, a small amount of oil or a very light coat of oil, does tongue oil react differently with softwood compared to hardwood? Um, well, anytime you do use oil on... It, it, it has less to do with the type of wood and more to do with how porous it is. Um, is it ring porous or is it diffuse porous? Um, or like softwoods, they, they act like they're diffuse porous. Um, it's a slightly different thing because it's a whole other ball of wax. Um, but with things that are diffuse porous like birch, um, like maple, like pine, uh, well pine is, is softwood, um, but they tend to get blotchy with oils um, and so you, you need to be careful with that. Whereas with a lot of ring porous woods like oak and ash, you, you want that blotchiness because then that shows off the difference in the grain structure. Uh, whereas with smoother surface woods, that blotchiness shows up as blotchy sections. It doesn't show up as separation of the grain structure. Um, and so for woods that are of a very smooth texture, you're probably going to want to do a pre-stain. Um, and that will actually clog all the pores completely. So when you put the oil on it, you'll get a much even... Um, absorption across the board um, and that's usually the biggest thing. Did I answer that question or did I go off on a different tangent? What was the question? Tongue oil, does it react differently with softwood compared to hardwood? So yeah, not, not particularly softwood to hardwood but as to the grain structure that can be different. I'm not gonna lie, I kind of tuned you out. <laughs> it's normal, I'm used to it. <laughs> I was just waiting for you to stop talking to ask my next question. Well, what's the next question then? <laughs> Sorry, I was distracted by Matt talking about roasting seven lambs because we got on my big fried Greek wedding. Yes. And I said, it's okay, make lamb. And then I. Her family doesn't roast lamb in the front yard, they, they do in the backyard. Do I have glasses that match my hoodies? No, I just like blue and teal and. Yeah, Turquoise. she has glasses and hoodies that match her. <laughs> they did get new glasses, so thanks for noticing. Um, anyways, Hopman asks, has James updated hand tool fi fi finder in the last six months? Uh, yeah, I put, I, I'm, I'm regularly putting new things on the map and taking them off and um, usually uh, once or twice a week someone sends me something or I find something different. Um, or a company goes out of business, um, and so it's it's regularly getting updated. Um, I think you just did a big update not that long. Well, I did the the lumber finder. Oh, that's what it was. Lumberfinder.net, because lumberfinder.com is already taken, and woodfinder.com is similar but does it really poorly. <laughs> I was afraid you were going to say something else. Anyways. <laughs> Lumberfinder.net, I, 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 that one I'm, I'm working on, but there's it's like 600 some locations around the world for where to find lumber. Hmm. What's next? It's 9 o'clock, that's what's next. Ah, well I think that will do it. Um, I'm not sure what next week's will be. Uh, the week after that we're actually going to have a guest on talking about sharpening. Um, he's a, a, a cool guy with some very interesting background, so I'll look forward to that. 
here in person? No, it'll be a, a, a zoom in. Uh, I was like... He's out on the East Coast. That would be a long drive. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.